Sounds good. Um, yeah, uh, good to see you. Thank you uh, so much for taking the time to do this again. I really appreciate Happy it. To, Happy to do so. I have very limited time, unfortunately, I, and we lost some of it jumping around between rooms. I have to, I have a hard out at 12 o'clock. Okay. Um, so I had uh, stuff on Nishitani, some stuff on Han and Saving Beauty and some miscellaneous stuff. Okay, let's go for it. All right. Uh, so it seems to me that um, like flow and uh, being in touch with things that uh, you talked about with Secure the Dawn, uh, serious play, especially in playing the infinite game like you talked with James Karsh recently, which was great. Yeah. Uh, continuity of contacts and then... Uh, and maybe the synchronicities that Anderson Todd talk of, but not necessarily that is sort of what all related to what Joseph Campbell was talking about by following your bliss. I feel like to some extent. Uh, I think I think so. I mean, the pro that many people have criticized that uh, from Joseph Campbell, um, and and not totally illegitimately either. I think Campbell was a little was vague on that. Uh, he was passionate about it, but he didn't. He didn't bring a lot of articulation and clarification to what that meant. And so, I mean, in, in the kind of culture that we have, uh, people heard finding your bliss as do, it, do, do whatever makes you happy or go where your dreams take you or follow your gut, you know, various forms of decadent romanticism. Um, and um, and that, that often just leads people horribly, horribly astray um, in, in, in a lot of powerful ways. Um, I think a charitable interpretation of Campbell's interpretation of Jung, we've got sort of interpretations playing around here, is exactly what you said. That what Campbell was talking about is uh, that something like maybe more properly like, like the Stoics talked about when they talked about joy. Joy is not the sense of pleasure. It's uh, David Brooks talks about this. It's not the same thing as sort of happiness. Happiness sort of solidifies in the, the self. Whereas joy is a sense of being connected to something greater than yourself that reliably uh, deepens your sense of connectedness. Um, so it's not just a stagnant sense of connectedness, it's generative, it, 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 it grows in beauty. And yeah. so in, in that sense, I, I, yeah, I think in that sense, yeah. Um, if we interpret uh, Campbell to list to mean that enjoyment, like even the word might mislead us, but let's go back to enjoyment rather, meaning that like, being in joy rather than having pleasure, um, uh, that it is, comes about because one is mattering, connected to something that is generatively greater than oneself, then I think Campbell is uh, talking about that. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I agree. You have, to say, you have to say all of that because uh, Campbell was pretty reliably, mis if that's the right reading, and I think it's a good one, that he was pretty reliably misread and misunderstood. Um, and so that's problematic. Yeah. So do you think uh, a collective open-ended telos of serious playing of the infinite game could be like a necessary or even sufficient telos for humans or society generally? Or do you think it's simply like more relevant in liminal times like ours? I think I agree with James, James Carr's. Uh, yeah, and you're right. That was a, that was that's the second time I, I've I've met with James, uh, that I really, uh, I, like, I really enjoyed that very thoroughly, um, in the in the sense of enjoyment. Um, uh, I I agree with James. I think it's something that human beings should always. I think the answer is yes, both. Um, that it's something human beings should always be pursuing, because I think it's integral to uh, to that aspect of wisdom that's about cultivating and deepening our humanity and our personhood. And, and that serious play is the developmental forum in which that is cultivated uh, and grown. Uh, but I think it's also particularly relevant right now uh, because of you know the Jordan Hall's uh, standing argument, which I deeply respect, that we are entering into a qualitative change um, in, in terms of the challenges that we're facing. That we're that we it's a non-linear and complexifying um, challenge that we're facing, and so we need to refine our tools for tracking our way through that um, better and better. Yeah, um, yeah. It also seemed similar to uh, the the reciprocal opening you associate with 
enlightenment and anagage and then process metaphysics. And then I, I like the idea of a adverbial existence as opposed to a noun or a verb even. Yeah. And then maybe the Nietzschean overflow that Lehman Pascal talked of. Very much. Like, I, uh, uh, so I wouldn't want to simply, and I don't think you're doing this, I'm not accusing you of anything. I wouldn't want to simply identify all these things, but your, your sense that there is a deep emerging convergence between these that will, in, so that they will all mutually enhance each other's intelligibility and plausibility and therefore realness, because I think realness is just highly plausible intelligibility. Um, I think that that, uh, that is very much happening right now. It's very exciting. So what, I, what I'm seeing is the, the upspringing of all these communities of practices like RAVES and others, right? And the, the Movement Summit was just a celebration of all of that. And then what I also see is that what you might call the theoretical level, right? The philosophical level, you've also got all of these things that are now converging in this really uh, organic and uh, mutually affording fashion, like you just mentioned. And, so, and, the, and, the, and then those two things are also talking to each other. It's a very exciting time. So it might be, it might be that something is growing that's rich enough, and its rate of growth is fast enough um, that it will be able to allow us to overtake what threatens to overwhelm us. Um, yeah, I agree. And the movement summit was amazing. Your speech there was one of my favorites ever. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. Uh, Rafe has promised that he will. Rafe has promised that he will make that public. So I'm hoping that will happen. Great. Um, so do you think it's possible to feel a kind of certainty about an ideal uh, in a healthy manner, like an aspiration, an aspirational ideal or value rather than a proposition, even if it changes uh, in emphasis over time? And would there be like a difference in brain state between the aspirational ideal based certainty and fixed propositional certainty? Yeah, I, I'm sort of hesitant to use the word certainty. That's why uh, right. Jordan and I have been exploring the, this notion of uh, the reinventio of faith. Uh, 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 but, the, the, uh, but the problem with that is the modern notion of faith is basically unjustified certainty, <laughs> which is a ridiculous notion. Uh, uh, I, I'm not saying that is the sole notion of faith. That's precisely why I've looked into ancient versions of that, like the ah, and then more moder modern or postmodern or metamodern with uh, Jordan uh, about this continuity of contact and coupling and, and the aspirational ideals that keep us coupled. I think the word I would prefer, therefore, um, is, is more like trust rather than certainty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote that as well. Faith or trust. Strong faith or trust might describe that more accurately. Um, and and, and like, like epistemic certainty, trust is also earned. Like you earn epistemic certainty by providing good argumentation and evidence. I don't think there is such a thing as certainty. Maybe in math, who knows? Even math is going through philosophical changes right now. Uh, but uh, I think you, but you, all, you also earn trust, but you earn trust differently than you earn certainty. Let's call it, you know, very strong conviction. That's what certainty is. I think, yeah, uh, when you earn trust, you earn it a little bit more different. You earn it differently. That's just a little bit more differently. I think in a substantially different manner. Um, so I could, there's a sense in which, and you probably had this where you, you can be sort of relatively certain about somebody, uh, but that's not the same thing as trusting them. And you can be, you can trust somebody and be fairly open-ended. You're not going to know how they're going to go. Um, and one of my prototypical mythological references for that, Paul Vanderclay will love this, is from C.S. Lewis, uh, where the kids are asking some of the talking animals in Narnia about Aslan. Uh, the Christ uh, figure, the lion. Uh, and they say, oh, is he a tame lion? And it's, oh, no, he's not tame, but he's good, right? So he's not predictable in the right. sense that a tame creature is. You, 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 you're not certain how he's going to behave, but, you're, but you trust, however it comes out, that it will be for the good. And so it's something like that that's what I'm trying to point towards. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you think it might be somewhat related to like, right hemisphere versus left hemisphere with like Ian McGilchrist. Oh. The propositional fix. Oh, system. yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of was implicit in some of the discussion I had with Ian, but I hadn't explicated it. That's very insightful, Connor. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, and trust may have to do with sort of 
the senses of realness for the for propos, uh, for procedural and perspectival and participatory knowing. Yeah, so I trust something when I sense it as powerful. Aslan fits that bill. That's the procedural. Yep. Uh, when it's when there's a sense of presence, and of course Aslan has that presence, you know, almost charismatic presence, and then participatory that there's a sense of fittedness. Um, I know by identifying with, and of course you're supposed to identify with Christ. I actually that's pretty good, and I think the perspectival um, is is much more in the right hemisphere, and I think important aspects of. Uh, the participatory in the right hemisphere, but also midline too. But that, that that's good. I like that. That's that's that. Yeah, I think that's insightful. Yeah, Ian often talks about in the book on how the right hemisphere is more uh, connected to the world in a holistic way, whereas the left hemisphere yeah. abstracts things and reduces yep. that to the parts, features. Yep. Or something. Yep. So, yeah. Very much, very much. And so certainty is generally um, born out of a, a sense of correspondence and coherence. That you've you've got you've got the parts all cohere, and if they cohere together and they're confirmed, right? Confirmation, yeah. Then that then that corresponds to the world. Whereas the right hemisphere is more of truth in the sense, the Heideggerian sense of aletheia, that there's a co-emergence of the agents and arena such that they reliably belong together and fit together and make affordances uh, possible for us, viable for us. Well, speaking of which, uh, one of my other random questions was, how would you differentiate between Dasein and like good participatory and perspectival knowing? So I think Dasein is the, so th this is where you have to be careful where you're using something axiologically or deontologically. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, if there's two meanings of the word rational. One meaning is that which is in contrast to irrational. Like I'm rational in a way a chair is not rational. You can hold me to standards of rationality. That's a different use of rational from the, the sense of rational that contrasts with irrational. So things have to be axiologically rational before you can judge them deontologically. Like, right, right. So I have to belong to the kinds of things that are rational in the sense that rationality applies to me uh, before you can judge me as being in contrast to, to, to you know, uh, like, rational or irrational yes. in that contrast. Um, and, and, and so I think Dasein is the axiological. It's the statement of our participatory uh, being and, and, and also um, perspectival, because I think that I'm influenced by Dreyfus on this. Sorry, there's some noise in the background. I, I can't avoid that right now. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think the Dasein is the axiological sense, like rational. So the analog is Dasein is like, ra like an analog as to how rational is contrasted to irrational. And then good participatory knowing, right? Um, like reciprocal opening and religio and things like that. that that's, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's like in the contrast between rational and irrational. So all human beings, are, have, they, I, I argue they, they must have a Dasein, but that doesn't mean that all human beings have a good participatory knowing. Did that answer your question? Yeah, does Heidegger also distinguish between like self-aware uh, proper Dasein and just like the default Dasein that's axiological? I think so, but what I'm gonna say now is controversial because it's Heidegger. I think authenticity um, is that second thing. I think authenticity is people having a reflective awareness and identification with their participatory knowing, yes. And I imagine he would uh, make the being towards death like an essential part of the authenticity. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I mean, one way of understanding that, this isn't in Heidegger, but I don't think it contradicts Heidegger, is you know, participatory knowing is how we have been shaped by biological evolution, nature in, in sort of Heidegger's term. So, you know, we, we've co-shaped each other in evolution, niche construction. And then of course there's historical cultural co-shaping and Heidegger talks a lot about that historicity. And then of course there's our, our, our right now, uh, all right, our, our sort of sense-making picked up by people like Dreyfus and Evan Thompson, the neo-Heideggerians uh, within Cogsci. And so I think authenticity is um, somebody who's picking up on all of those, uh, those 
those co-shapings. And one way in which Heidegger at times refers to all of them uh, in, in a coordinated fashion is our mortality. Because our mortality is obviously our biological, we are, we are fitted into nature and we are, we are mortal in a biological sense. And mortal doesn't just mean, being unto death doesn't mean the, just the event of your death. It means that you are, you are a finite and fallible being at all times and therefore vulnerable to, uh, to the, always vulnerable to the way in which being um, exceeds you. And then of course the same is history. You're always immortal with respect to your historical existence. And then finally, you're, you're always immortal, amortal uh, with, with respect uh, to your, so, you know, stuff I talk about, paying attention to your cognitive biases and how fallible and finite your cognition is and how that both enables you as a relevance realizer to be cognitive, but also opens you up to self-deception. That's also, I would argue, uh, to identify with your mortality. And, and one of the big things we have to do, and this is, something Heidegger gets, I think, from the Greeks, although he's influenced, I think, by Christianity, is we have to deeply identify with our mortality, you get this very much in Plato, while relating to the divine. Yeah. Without, without ever ceasing to be mortal, um, so we, we also are, we are the, the mortal things that relate to the immortals, or better, the eternals. Yeah, I agree. Um... So on saving beauty, your new hypothesis, which I really like of virtue as the beauty of wisdom, yeah. I thought aligns really well with one of Han's quotes on constitutive of beauty is the freedom of the parts for themselves within the whole. And yeah. that like you could see virtue uh, as being applied by a uh, phronesis, like with good relevance realization, right. such that wisdom in a certain context means being courageous at the right time. And at that time, courage is prioritized above anything else. Like it's free right. yourself yeah. fully within the whole of wisdom rather than any one virtue always taking precedence in a fixed way. That's great. And that's the Sophia aspect. Yes, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah. And, uh, but uh, maybe I didn't give enough credit. I did try to give credit to Han repeatedly. He, his books, Saving Beauty and The Sense of Time, the Agony of Eros, um, and I, I think also the Burnout Society, but especially the first two I mentioned, they've had a profound influence on me, profound influence on me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and my attempt to try and relate wisdom and virtue and beauty together that I did with Andrew and, and Andrew Sweeney and Chris Messerfield-Pietro was deeply inspired by Han. So that, I think that connection is, is, is correct. Yeah. yeah, I still need to read The Scent of Time, but that conversation was, was really incredible. <laughs> Like you're on fire there. Uh, so I had a, a argument for the love and virtue of of uh, video games related to beauty. So like virtue. So virtue is the beauty of wisdom, and then appreciation of beauty is training in virtue, right? Yep. Yep. That's uh, sorry. Yep. And flow states are part of a continuum with insight and enlightenment at some point. Um, yep. And video games can like when they're high quality and not trying to be addictive, combine beauty with flow state induction. Uh, and so therefore have the potential for training in virtue and the it insight could. spectrum to enlightenment. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm also exploring with Daniel Gregg, I'm gonna release a video, you know, sort of uh, online uh, live action role playing as oh. a way he's, put, he's, uh, he's creating a game and he's trying to recruit people into it. I'll release that video soon called uh, The Great Awakening in which you basically are in a fantasy world, but in Tolkien sense, you go in there, like the way good fiction trains our imagination so that we can better perceive the world. Um, and so I think if people made video games with an eye to transferring them to, with an eye to affording transfer to the real world, right, such that wisdom uh, is afforded, I think that would be high art and it would be, it would verge to, to my mind to be uh, almost being religious art because when you go to church, you go into a video game, right? I, like, I don't mean that in an insulting saying, you, you have, it's a special, it's a special time and place and there's different rules and right. And you, and you do this serious play and the idea is it's supposed to transfer to the rest of your life. Same thing when you go to the dojo, uh, et cetera. And so I think that if video games were explicitly 
and with expertise design so that they would afford transfer back to the real world. And let's be honest, many video games don't. No, uh, but, if, but, but if they did, that would both ameliorate the temptation to addiction and afford the cultivation of wisdom the way you just said. And I think that's a great idea. And I think Daniel is, is doing some really excellent work uh, making that, like trying to get that happening. He's trying to actually recruit a community of people to build design and start to promote and play this game that he's, uh, as a way of trying to uh, carry serious play in response to the meeting crisis out into the world at large. Yeah, that's amazing. I'd definitely be interested in that because I feel like serious play is perhaps best realized in a good video game, like if it has the options. So I, I, I think well, what uh, I asked him about this, like I said, I'll release this video soon. I asked him about, um, you know, could you do an augmented reality thing where you have the sort of like live action role playing integrated with uh, more, you know, video virtual stuff. And he thought he, he's, he's considering that, but he wants to get the live action thing going first because he thinks uh, that has a much more direct community building aspect to it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, just stop me whenever you need to leave. I should I, I should go actually. Okay. Um, I'm you. happy. To, uh, I, I love these little conversations. I think, that, sorry, little sounded diminutive and dismissive. I didn't mean it. Well, sure, sure. That's what I should have yeah. said. I like these short conversations. They're great. Um, I, I'm happy to do this again. Just send me another email. Let's meet up and keep going. You always ask great questions. And I like the, the fact that you're posting some of these at the ones you think are good. So please continue to do that. This is really Excellent. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll look forward to seeing you again sometime. Yeah, well, yeah, like I said, send me an email. We'll set up another one. Should be able to do another one of these in September, I hope. Excellent. All right. See you. Okay. Take good care. Great questions today. Really enjoyed them. Thanks. You too.